Good evening. How are you this evening? Well, it was raining and dark by the time I could uh, talk to you, so uh, I'm uh, standing and talking instead of walking and talking. Uh, I feel a strong sense of dystopia and toxicity in our country now. And one of the reasons is the, the lack of clarity and objectives. In Georgia, I don't understand why they had a grand jury that could do no more than issue a report. That was written by the prosecutor, and I assume that the judge asked the uh, Georgia grand jury, what do you want me to do with this report? And they said, oh, I'll well, publish it, you know. Uh, I don't know. Or maybe it was the judge's idea, which is a bad idea if you really do have other people you're going to prosecute imminently. So it's like one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. It's not clear to me. And the uh, lawyer they're going to come up against is a very fine lawyer. I knew him from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I was on their board for a while. I was a very active member. I'm still a member, but I'm not so active. And so uh, they're going to come up against a lawyer who's dealt with RICO and, and has caused great problems for those Georgia prosecutors because of his ability. And if they go with RICO, which would be the big case, instead of the thin case, and the thin case is the tape recording, I think they're making a mistake. But nobody's listening to me, and I'm not on the case, so uh, nobody will. But I think it would be such a, a terrible injustice to waste the strongest case in America, in, and it's in Georgia, against Trump by muddying it up by wanting to get more people than Trump. This should be a gut Trump case. Now, at the same time that this is going on, Trump is being restored to social media. He's going to have access to the millions going on and you know, all those people out there. And we have the, the people on the Hill, that is uh, McCarthy and company, doing reprisals against those who were investigating the president and impeachment cases and being concerned about the security of our nation. Now there's a reprisal against them for upholding the law by those who broke the law. And there's a lesson there. The lesson is that these people now who are in the position, McCarthy and others, to have reprisals against uh, Schiff and, uh, and uh, Swalwell, well, if we had acted then, when we had control of the Congress and we had the margin in the Senate against these people who committed these crimes, we'd be in a better place now. But you make one bad decision, it leads to another bad decision, and now we're compromised because not only is our government paralyzed, putting aside the partisan differences, but we have an incompetent complement of extremist Republicans who can't find their hindquarters with both hands and who would strain out of the active roles, say in intelligence, for example, they, the, the best and the brightest that we have, whose job would be to have that kind of a history so they could be helpful in these matters involving intelligence and foreign affairs. But they don't care about that. It's like the, well, the insane have taken over the, the government. And uh, they don't care, and they're very good at destroying. And they did try to destroy the government, but they weren't good enough, and so we stopped them. And then it's like that bad movie where you leave the guy behind after you punched him and he finds a gun and he comes at you and he shoots you. Well, that's these guys. We, we didn't do what we should have done in an accounting. And I often quote, and you probably heard me do it, Sir Thomas More saying to his uh, son-in-law, Roper, you know, if you tear down on the laws and they're man's laws, not God's laws, he was a very religious man, then uh, how could you stand in the wind that would blow. And that's where we are. Because we, we made wrong decisions. That is, we failed to act. We lacked the courage. We lacked the discipline. We, we lacked the knowledge to do what history has told us we should have done. And we didn't do that. And so now we have the Congress that normally would have the right to appoint people to these positions. But the incentive and the motive is reckless. It's, uh, it's actually a betrayal of their oath to preserve and protect their Constitution because their objective appears to be to navigate us toward a position in which we're an autocracy instead of a democracy. Now, one a good example is uh, take Ukraine. How could the Republicans be supporting Russia and denying 
and resisting aid to Ukraine. How is that possible? And there must be a deal that we don't know about, but I'm sure that's what they're doing. What else do we have going on? Well, Pompeo, who's the Secretary of State, just to give you a taste of how venal these people are, has sort of uh, poo-pooed the fact that Khashoggi, who is both a journalist and a political activist, was dismembered uh, under the guidance of Mohammed bin Salman. And uh, he's fine with that. He thinks, well, it's just those liberals, you know, they, they just never like those people. And Saudi Arabia. Well, really, dismembering a person so visible like that in a location that's supposed to be neutral and embassy? Pretty bad stuff. And then on the Democratic side, and it doesn't balance out all the terrible things happening on the Republican side, we have Manchin, who wants to delay the tax credits for, electronic, for electric vehicles. Uh, what kind of decision is that? Here we are looking for ways as global warming increases to decrease these kinds of emissions and we have these electric cars. We don't want to encourage people to use them. We don't want to encourage people to use uh, all of that technology that does not depend on fossil fuels. So uh, our nation is at a, uh, a crossroads and we've already taken several steps down the wrong road. We've taken a road toward <laughs> perdition, if you will. We've taken a road toward toxic dystopia, toward betraying uh, this nation's origin and those steps that we've taken that perfected this nation as much as it has. And in that regard, <laughs> we have uh, the leading other candidate for the presidency in the Republican primaries, uh, the governor of Florida, DeSantis who is saying, oh, whatever you do, don't teach those kids about our discrimination. How do you not talk about the slave trade? How do you not talk about the Civil War? How do you not talk about the things that have happened in history? And the responses that were constructive and generous and democratic and mirrored are, are words that all men are created equal, and women too. How, how do we justify that? But the governor of Florida and Trump and these ill-considered baboons who form the leadership of the Republican conference or the caucus on the House side, they're, they're not concerned about the future of America because they're there to bring down the House. And for those of you out there who think, uh, and I doubt that there are many among those who are listening to this, who think that Oh, you know, we, we get good things. They're foul people and they say terrible things and they have, you know, they, we just, they shouldn't exist with polite society, but they're getting what I want. Well, for the very wealthy, it means they're just saving money and they discount everything else government does. And so the notion that our government shouldn't have anything to do with Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid and those kinds of things, and those are on the table in this debt limit fight. So uh, I've jumped around on a bunch of issues and... Uh, if you have a chance uh, tomorrow evening, I should be on with uh, Ari Melber uh, sometime between 6 and 7. And then uh, we're hopping a, a car, probably separately, because I'll probably get off before he does, and go to Politics and Prose, which is a, a somewhat heralded bookstore in Washington, D.C. And anybody who's interested in politics has probably been there for some review of books. And uh, uh, after Ari speaks, I'll speak, and the people ask him, questions and answers. And uh, it's a decent sized crowd. I know 500 or 600 people. I don't know if there's still room. You have to uh, make reservations. It's a, it's a gorgeous bookshop. If you don't go uh, tomorrow, uh, try another time. Uh, in the meantime, I wish you all well. Uh, what is our remedy? Our remedy is to talk. Our remedy is to call people out. My greatest strength and my weakness, I think, is my clarity of expression. And I make no apologies for it. I will correct anything I find I'm wrong on. But these days, there's so much to find is wrong that remaining silent is a failure to meet your requirements as a citizen. And if you're in elected office, a failure to talk up and work hard for the things that matter in this country uh, and to, to fight for the law and the order, which is something maybe as a kid I didn't think I'd find myself saying that way because I just sort of assumed it, I think. 
But being a lawyer my whole life, 50 years of practice, and seeing the circumstances in which law makes a difference for the better, uh, we're better off with it than not. And this is how we avoid being unable to stand in the wind that would blow with the chaos and anarchy that comes with the kind of leadership the current Republicans embrace rather than recoil from. <clears throat> so uh, nice visiting with you, and I hope to be on the trail tomorrow and uh, watch Ari, and uh, maybe I'll wave to you then. Bye-bye.